My name is Dean Cullinan. I'm 20 years old, half Irish, half German. I was born in Ireland. I was born and raised amongst a, a Catholic family. Always went to Sunday church and that. And then we came over here when, when I was eight. And we came over here because my mum was being abused. And so we were forced to run away from our home. And so, you know, we came over and everything was cool. I was going to a Catholic school, you know, as you do if you're Catholic, you go to a Catholic school normally. And I started to see that there was something wrong with, with church. I started to see that, that the Catholic church is Something wasn't right, personally, for me. So basically, around the age of 13, 14, I left the church. And, you know, truthfully, I was only, like, if I was in the church, you know, I would be there, like, playing my Game Boy or something. Like, I was never really there for God. And the church kind of, like, I always believed God was real, but the church kind of made me think, like, you know, if this is it, then, then God can't be real. If, if this is it, if this is all it's about. And so, I left the church and I developed like, like a hatred for God. I developed a hatred, a, a deep, deep, deep hatred for any kind of father figure. And the earliest memory I have of my life, I was three years old. I remember it like it was yesterday. And I was hearing noises in my room. And so I, you know, I was sleeping. It was it was it was early morning hours, and I came out of the room, and I could hear screaming. And I know that voice. That's my mum's voice. And so I walked towards the front room, and the light was on. And I I, I opened the door slowly, and I, and I peeked in, and I seen this man on top of my mum, and he was stabbing her in her leg. And I didn't know what to do. And I started crying. And my mum seen me and she started crying. And then, you know, I, I, I ran back into my room. And a few years later, my mum told me that the man that was stabbing her in the leg, that was my dad. And that's kind of where it all stemmed from. Like, that's why, I, you know, If, if you heard Sydney's testimony, you know, we, we tend to hear it a lot these days that, you know, women get, get, you know, they get raped and that. People, they, they don't, they, they, you never hear the person talk, the person that's the result of the rape. You know, you hear about the woman a lot, but when, when, when you grow up and you know that, that you, that your life is a result of rape, and, and when for your whole life you feel like you're a mistake, I grew up with that feeling and my brother's dad came along and I hated him. My dad was never around so I hated him. My mum, when we came over here, she was going out with another guy and I hated him. That didn't last long. But then my mum got married and I hated this guy. I hated him with a passion. And 
I, this, this, this father figure hatred, it made me hate God, it made me resent God. And so, you know, I left the church and that, you know, if anyone knows me from back in the day, you know, all I'd done was play football. That's all I'd done. It was my life. And so I met some people, you know, playing football and that. And these guys, these were like, you know, road guys. And like, I'll be honest, I wasn't one of those guys. I wasn't like a road guy. But the, the older I got, I, I, would, I would start to get more involved. And so, when you're with certain types of people, you, you get peer pressured into doing certain types of stuff. And I got to the place where I was becoming such a person that I was having thoughts of doing the stuff that was the reason why I'm here, if that makes any sense. I was hanging around with people that were affecting me in such a way and you get peer pressured into doing a lot of stuff. And so, you know, one of the things that, you know, was always hanging over my head was like, you know, Dean, you haven't really been with any girls. Like, you know, you've been with girls, but you haven't been with girls. And so one night I said, you know, I've had enough. And I went out looking for a certain type of girl and I found a certain type of girl and I took her back home. And all my friends were there, I told them to be there. All my friends were there, and I brought her inside like she was some kind of trophy. And then things started to get deep. I was in a relationship that was, you know, purely based on sex, and we both knew it. And she started to develop feelings. You know, girls tend to do that a lot. Us men, we're, we're, we're more drawn back, you know, we're, we, we, we restrict ourselves to that kind of stuff. But women are very emotional. And so she, she was getting feelings. And so I kind of just said, you know, that's, that's it for me, man. Now I'm bailing out, innit? And um, that's the thing about sin. If, if, if you think that you can run away from it by yourself, you, you know, you're being deceived because you can't. You can't. And so, I had broke up with this girl and, and I kept going back. And I wasn't going back because, you know, because I thought she was pretty. I was going back to get what I needed to get. And it got to the point where I started to get so focused on, on looking at girls in a certain way. I was losing myself, man. I was, I was losing myself. I was changing. And so I cried out to God in my bath. I was in the bath and the shower was on and I was sitting down. And the lights weren't on, it was pitch dark. And I cried out to God, I said, you know, if you're actually there, if you're there and you care for me like a father is meant to care for his son. If you care for me like a father is meant to care for his son, not like how my dad cared for me. If you care for me like a father is meant to care for his son, then you need to show me that. And so the next day I was on Facebook and my ex, not the one that I was doing foolishness with, my ex, you know, she spoke to me. It was just, you know, the hi, bye, how you doing thing. And then out of the blue, she, you know, she said she was going to call me. And like for, 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 for a, a good couple, a good few months, I had, I was going out with this girl that I was, you know, doing foolishness with. We'd never spoke on the phone because there was no, you don't need to get to know someone if, if you don't want to know them. If you just want to use them. And so she called me and we spoke all night on the phone and she was telling me, you know, how, how God has been doing stuff for her life. And I was like, you know, oh, him again. 
you know, what you like, it's, it's great that he's doing stuff for you. But meanwhile, I'm growing up with, with these feelings and I'm being left to rot. And I've never had a father, I've never had someone to come into my life and say, Dean, this is how you're meant to do things. I've always just been by myself. And so we kind of, we got speaking more. And we started, we, you know, we entered into a relationship. But she was very firm, she was like, you know, I don't know what you were doing before, but you know, if there was anything, it's, it's not happening this time. And I was like, okay, cool. And you know, part of me wanted to believe her. But part of me was like, you know, Dean, don't forget who you are, man. Don't forget, you know, who you've grown up with. Anyways, we went a month and um, her parents found out. And we didn't tell her parents, you know, because she's Christian, her parents are Christian and that. Parents found out and they wanted to meet me. And, you know, I'd never done the whole parent meeting thing because, you know, why would I? Met her, her parents. And her dad said to me, you know, Dean, if you really want to get to know our daughter, then, you know, you should go to church with her once because, you know, her, her, her life is based around church. In my head, I was thinking, okay, so if I can go through one church session, then I've done what they want and I'm good to go. Like, you know, to carry on a relationship without their input. So I went to the church, it was, it was a Friday night, about 7.30, it was at Woolsden Seventh-day Adventist Church. They were Seventh-day Adventists. And I went there and I was thinking like, you know, what, an hour left? Because it wasn't nothing special, if I'm going to be honest. Like, it was just, you know, music and, you know, like waving your hands and that. And I was like, you know, I, can, I see this on TV all the time. If this is what, you know, God, if this is what you're trying to show me, then, then you know, come the end of this hour, I'm, I'm, I'm gone, man. And then people started, you know, they had this, they started passing a microphone around to give testimonies. And they started to talk as if, as if God was real. Like, not, you know, up there, but he was real, he was in their life. They started to say, oh yeah, you know, like, um, I was in this situation and, you know, I said, I'm just going to trust God and then it worked. And then, you know, I spent the whole night thanking him and me and my family were bringing in the Sabbath. I didn't have a clue what the Sabbath was. Bringing in the Sabbath with the family, you know, it's just, it's great to feel God's presence. And in my head, I'm thinking, you nutters. There's no way God is real. Like, if you knew what was going on in my life, you wouldn't be running around saying, you know, Sabbath, Sabbath. Like, be real. But I felt something there that I can't explain because the more they started to talk about how real God was, the more I kind of started to think it myself. And I had this thing inside me, I don't know what it was, but it told me that very same night, it was like, Dean, you know you're going to be a Seventh-day Adventist, innit? And I left that place so confused. And I got home and, and I called my girlfriend and I was like, you know, that was that, I haven't really experienced that before. But it wasn't proof that God was real. So, you know, they suggested Bible study and I was like, cool, you know, give me what you got. We studied Revelation and Daniel. Now, I, had, I didn't have a clue what that even meant. But we studied it. And the second time we studied, we studied Daniel 2. And my girlfriend's sister broke down the, the um, you know, the prophecy and you know, the whole Nebuchadnezzar's dream and that broke it down. And, and the moment that the study finished, I was like, that's it, God is real? That has to be it? Like you can't do all that and not be real. And so I left, I left there and you know, of the full realization that God is real, like I would have been willing, and this is no word of a lie, I would have been willing there and then to give my life to God, like to die for God right there. And I got home and Things started to go boom, like they just dropped. For, like I didn't tell no one that you know what I was going through, but but things started to go crazy at home, and you know my mum she wasn't having it. Like like things were happening that you know it doesn't make sense. Like there was no reason for them things to happen, but they were happening in the house. There there was nothing to provoke the situation, but the situation would arise. Anyways. I knew my mum, you know, she, 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 she's, she's not supportive of, of this whole religion thing. As she says it, the church thing. She's, 
she's not on it. And I knew that and like, I love my mum more than, I love my mum. And I was so scared of, of being some kind of disappointment to her because of things that I was going through now. When I, when I was in school, in, in, you know, in Catholic school, I got an A star in my RE GCSE. I got 98 out of 100. But I didn't dare put that on my CV in case someone thought that I wanted to be some kind of priest. I said, there's no way that's because I was ashamed of everything that had anything to do with God. And so I grew up thinking, you know, if anyone finds out that, you know, I'm having Bible study, what are you going to think about me? That same dean that... So I said, I need to get myself a Bible. And I looked online and, you know, I found the cheapest one I could get from Amazon. And the moment I bought it, I realized that it's going to be delivered to my house. And if my parents see it, they're going to know. They're going to know that I've got the Bible in the house and they're going to switch. And, you know, I don't blame my parents for this at all. Not one bit. I love them to bits. But, you know, they don't, they didn't understand. But anyways, I took all the time off work and I waited for the Bible to come. And the moment it came, you know, I was sitting on the stairs and I seen it, you know, the, the, the postman walked past the door and then he came back and he knocked and I had to sign for it and I ran upstairs with the Bible in my hand, fully in the package and I put it under my mattress. And then I ran back downstairs and, and you know, pretended everything was cool. And I was so scared of them finding out. But every, I couldn't help it. I was, I was, I was craving God. And so I would, every night, my brother, you know, he likes to read books sometimes before he goes to sleep. And he's got this, this little light that you attach onto the book and you can bend it to shine onto the words. And I, I took it and he knew it was gone. He said, where is it? I was like, I don't know. But I took it and I put it under my mattress as well. And every single night, I would, I would attach it onto me somehow or onto the cover and I would be under my cover and I would be reading through the Bible and I would be going over Daniel 2. I would be going over Revelation and I would, I would be looking for something to cling to, something else, something more. I was craving it. And then one day I was at work and I got home and my mum was just there and she was like, Dean, you got a Bible. Because, you know, my mum decided to change my sheets. Now, my mum doesn't do that. I, I'm, I was what? 19 why would my mom change my sheets but for some reason you know maybe she was just feeling extra kind but she changed the sheets and she found the bible and she was like you got a bible you know in a kind of half disappointed half what on earth is this kind of way you got a bible and I was like yeah and she was like why would you get a bible of all things like if out of all the books you could choose you get a bible and I was just like, yeah, feeling disappointed in myself. I was like, yeah, yeah, I, I got it. And, and I, was, I was shook, man. There was a fear in me that I don't know why I was scared, but I was scared. And so I would lie to my mum about going to church. I wouldn't tell her that I was going until the point where I was finding out more and more that God is real and yet I was then finding excuses to not go to church. I was then saying stuff like, I called my girlfriend and I said, look, I'm not coming to church no more. I'm not coming no more. Things are getting too hard and it's cause of church. And the next day I sat on my bed, you know, with a little wallpaper scraper. I told her I had to scrape the wallpaper. And I heard a voice, man, as clear as day. Clear as day, I heard a voice. It was telling me to go to church. I didn't know what it was at the time. I know what it was now. I know who it was now. But it was telling me to go to church. But I was still so scared, man. I was still so scared. So I ran down, I, I, put, on, I put on my football kit. I put on my football kit because I, I knew if, if, you know, on a weekday night, if I looked like I was going to some kind of funeral, you know, my parents would clock. And I couldn't have that, man. So I put my football kit and I bought my bag and I said, Mum, I'm going football tonight. And I ran outside. I ran down the road behind a bush. I got undressed and I put on my church clothes and I sprinted to the bus stop. I sprinted. I took my brother's Oyster card, sprinted to the bus stop got on the bus, got on the train, got on another bus. We started walking and got to the church that I knew that my girlfriend was at and her sister and her friends, I knew they were there. 
And so my heart was racing, man. And I walked in and the church was packed out. It was a campaign. It was packed, packed, packed. There was, it was so packed that there was people at the back, people behind and people, you know, standing around the sides. And I walked in and I knew everyone could see me. It was the middle of service. And I looked, I looked for my girlfriend and I seen her. And there was a, there was one space. There was a space there. I can still see it now. There was one chair free and the, there was people standing at the back. And I was like, what is this? And you know, I slowly started walking. I swear to God, it was the longest walk of my life. And I walked to this chair and I sat down and I pulled out my Bible. And it was a campaign, Sean Pickard and Andrew Fuller. And they preached their heart out, man. I swear they preached. <sighs> I was converted there and then. That's when I gave my life to Christ. A couple of weeks later, you know, I made the decision to get baptized. But this was, this was something that had to be done publicly. And so I went home and, I, and, and I, the next day I told my mom and my, and my stepdad, come into the front room and we sat down and I said look I'm gonna get baptized next week and my mum just said no and I was like what do, you, what do you mean no she was like no you're not she's like I don't care what you say there's no way you're getting baptized like you're a Catholic why would you get baptized again to another church like you're just doing this because you're a girlfriend you're just doing this you know all this nonsense I prayed there and then, right there in front of them. And I said, God, man, you need to get me through this. This is something else. And by the end of the conversation, my mom said that she was going to come to the baptism. She said, you know, at about 11 o'clock, there's no way you're getting baptised. And then by 11.30, she was like, what, do, what am I going to wear? And, you know, Sabbath came. Sabbath day. And my mum was at the baptism. And the devil was going in on my life that very day. That very day, I almost pulled out. And, and as they dipped me into the pool, my mum was crying. My mum cried. She didn't even know what it meant to me, but something, she cried. I'll never forget that day. God saved my life. He saved me from some ridiculous stuff, man. I was in craziness I was getting deeper and deeper into craziness you know I was I was one step away from from scamming banks I was one step away from selling all kinds of nonsense Jesus Christ saved my life and people you know you hear this all the time man like I don't need God to be good you need God to be saved you might not think you need to be saved, but you need to be saved. The fact that you think you don't need to be saved means you definitely need to be saved. This world is crazy, man. This world is, is evil. And soon enough, we're going to leave. Soon enough, we're going to leave, man. It's not no joke. It's not no joke. There's something about us Christians, man. There's something about us because we tend to... We tend to, you know, get all excited for Christ, you know. Come back from camp meeting, everyone's buzzing. Something happens and you know, you're back down to where you were before you went. It's like a fire, you know. And the thing about us, man, when, when you're making a fire, you know, you have to add the coal, you have to add the wood. 
But the moment you stop, the fire goes out. It's, you know, it's logic. You need to constantly keep topping up the fire in order for it to keep burning. If you stop and you stop long enough to the point where the fire goes out, do you know how hard it is to get the fire burning again? Because it's just ash now, it's just waste. If you're on a path where you're following God and somehow you come off, I'm not going to lie, it's going to be super tough to come back on the path. But I'll say this straight up, man. The stuff that I was in, you know, I'm watching pornography every day of my life, speaking to girls in such a way, masturbation, violence, anger problems, growing up knowing that I, as a child, am a result of a rape. God took every single one of these things and made me the person who I am right now. God took every single one of these things that made me feel so dirty and filthy and like I was some kind of you know, disgrace to my family. He took all of those things and he said, Dean, I'm going to give you a new life. I've got a new life now. I've got new friends. You know, Clive, Leif, Daniel, Hannah, Roxy. I've got a family. I've still got my old family and I love them more than anything. But God has given me something more. God has given me a purpose now. God has given me... God has given me something. I can't even explain it, man. I can't explain it. Like, we would need to do a couple more testimonies. I can't explain it. How, how can you explain a king in a perfect world coming to give his life so that you, some any guy that, you know, can't stop doing this and that, he comes to give his life so you... That don't make sense. But it's God's love. And if there's anyone out there that thinks God isn't real, You need to get your fire burning, man. There's more to life than, you know, sex, drugs and rock and roll. There's more to life than studying at uni and then going partying on the weekend. There's more to life. You're called for something much better than that. As Christians, we're called for something much better than that. I know the sins that I was stuck in are the very same sins that, you know, many Christians are stuck in today. But we've got a mission. We've got a real mission. Clive Leif, you know what I'm talking about, man. We've got a real mission to go and save souls. And that's, that's what this is about. That's what I've given my life to. I've given my life to God. I've given my life to the fact that I don't care if I don't have a job. I couldn't care less if, you know, if I'm eating rice and beans for the rest of my life. I couldn't care less if I'm living in you know, a one-bedroom flat that has the toilet to the left and the kitchen to the right. I couldn't care less. You need to get serious, man. You need to choose God. You need to choose Jesus, man. Jesus saves. Jesus saves, man.